Um, Jen Kretzer was going to facilitate today, but um, she wasn't able to make it. So I am facilitator. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's 102 Eastern. So um, I'll get the ball rolling. Um, Robert is joining us today um, to speak about tornadoes and climate change, which is uh, actually uh, just for some context, Robert, something that has come up in a couple of calls um, that we as folks who work in the climate field uh, felt like we don't we don't know a ton about it over uh, uh, overall. And maybe I'm speaking for myself, but I, I think in past conversations, a few of a few of us have felt like we don't understand the connection super well. So it'll be great to hear um, about your knowledge and um, we can do introductions too. I'll go first. Um, I'm Gina. I'm the clean program coordinator. Um, and I will also make an announcement uh, soon after this call at 2.30 Eastern, we're going to be doing the Excel Summit share out event. Um, so the five working groups that have been meeting over the past six months are going to be presenting doing short brief presentations on what they the progress that they've made in their groups and then we'll be having breakout rooms to discuss those topics a little bit more so that'll be happening at 2 30 i'll put the link uh in the chat to that but that's my announcement um don is involved so i i'm gonna pass it over to him just because he's who i'm thinking of next <laughs> um Yes, so I, I will see, see Gina again at 2.30 and maybe some other folks here. Um, and uh, I'm Don Haas. I'm the Director of Teacher Programming at uh, the Paleontological Research Institution, PRI for short, and it's Museum of the Earth and Cayuga Nature Center, which are all in Ithaca, although I telecommute from Buffalo and I do climate change and energy stuff. Um, and I will pass to Rachel. Hi, thanks, Ben. I'm Rachel Wellman. I am a program coordinator at Florida Atlantic University Pine Dog Environmental Education Center, and I am leading the, our Climate Ready program. I will pass it to Anne. Oh, sorry, I had to uh, unmute. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Henderson, and I also work for Pine Jog Environmental Education Center, um, saving the world. It's like my husband always says, you know, he's like, "How was your day?" I'm like, "Oh, you know, saving the world, saving the world." It's like pushing a rope. So um, yeah, so I'm um, a uh, also a program coordinator, and um, yeah, then that's about it. That's what to, you know, whatever. So and then um, do we? Rachel, do we have any announcements that you want to make? I mean, I guess you could talk about, uh, how about talking about um, Climate Ready? You've got your upcoming program of Climate Ready. Yeah, I, I've mentioned it a couple meetings in the recent past, but yeah, we have our one semester model um, that's based off of the three semester model we had with through the NOAA ELP grant and um, that course starts in July. So we're getting really excited. Um, about planning for for that, so it's going to be like an action-packed week, and it's going to be amazing. So that's where you got is. <laughs> Tell them how many students you have. We have 21, 21 students this year. It'll be yeah. good. Um, how about uh, Katie? Yeah, hey everybody. Um, microphone now might be better over this one. Um, hey everyone, I'm Katie Wolfson, she, her. I'm the School and Public Programs Manager at the UCAR Center for Science Education at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, so we do a variety of um, Earth System Science Education programs um, for pre-K through 12 through adults. Um, uh, just kind of switching gears to our summer programs this week. Uh, we have our first summer group here uh, today, which is fun. Um, outside learning about our powerful planet and making seed balls and doing community science and that kind of stuff. So 
Um, so yeah, so we do a whole variety of, you know, uh, climate change education. Um, and then also, I don't see them on yet, but probably jumping in shortly, um, we also have two Smithsonian, uh, hey, there's one and there's Zoe. Uh, so we also have um, two interns that just started with us yesterday um, for eight weeks. Um, they're part of the Smithsonian Leadership for Change internship. Um, and so there we have Zoe Carl and also Aspen Malmberg. Um, so I just want to, we're just kind of doing introductions if you want to um, say hello and maybe a little bit about uh, what you're going to work on this summer. Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm going to be a senior at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign here in the fall. Um, I am going to be working on a program for teachers to learn more about weather and climate. And so specifically, I'm going to be doing um, engineering against climate change and resiliency for one of the field trips that NCAR does. So. And then we also just had hop on Aspen. Aspen was doing a really quick introduction. So if you just want to say hi to the group of um, who you are, where you go to school, and then uh, what your project is this summer. Yeah, hi. Um, I go, I'm, my name's Aspen. I go to Agnes Scott College. It's a really small school in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and this summer I will be creating a visual schedule to um, for students and whoever is coming to the museum to help guide them through the different activities and programs they'll be doing. And they literally just got uh, an update on their projects about 10 minutes ago. So <laughs> great job summarizing your projects on that. So um, all right, um, happy to be here, everybody. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. And um, thanks for uh, Introducing us, Katie, uh, it's always really good to have students on these calls, so I appreciate that. Um, Cass or Marie, I know Maria, Marie, you said you were eating, so yeah, Cass, you're available. Hey y'all, I'm Cass, she, her, hers pronouns. I um, live in Tampa, Florida, and I work with our climate little future on some of the amazing educator resources that we have so that we can help young people understand um, how the impacts of climate change connect to them and support our educators throughout the nation. Um, Y'all have actually featured some of our stuff on um, the clean resource website. So uh, we're just here to figure out how we can do more to support. Awesome. Thanks, Cass and Marie. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Marie Fargo, she, her pronouns, and I work for Climate Generation, which is a nonprofit based in Minneapolis. Um, our big event that we're working towards right now is our Summer Institute for Climate Change Education. I'll add a link in the chat. I know most of you have heard about this, but if you haven't, uh, we'd love for you to check it out and share it with your networks. Um, it's about a 300 person event bringing educators together virtually from across North America to talk about climate change and climate justice education. So very excited about it. It will be on July 15th through 18th. Yeah, uh, I'm excited. We're, uh, Clean is leading um, one of the cohort days and we are um, at a point where we finalized our agenda for the day. So I'm getting very excited about that. <laughs> um, great, well, I think that's everyone. Um, and Robert, I know, has some slides to share, so I'll let him introduce himself and also thank Rachel again for introducing us to him um, and making that connection. Um, but Robert, yeah, you should be able to share your screen if, you, if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Gina. Uh, yeah, good to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Robert Moyeda. I'm the meteorologist in charge with the National Weather Service Miami South Florida forecast office. So we're one of the 122 forecast offices that serves, you know, different parts of the country uh, with local weather, day-to-day -day weather forecasts, uh, mornings, for example, you know, for any type of weather events, whether it's uh, flooding, tornadoes, hurricanes, et cetera. So we, uh, these, each of our local forecast offices are responsible for our specific geographic area. So we, for example, the South Florida office, we only forecast, we forecast exclusively for the Southern Florida Peninsula. So all the forecasts and warnings for those areas 
come from from my office. So my really my my expertise is in day to day weather forecasting. Not not so much on the on the long term climate side. That's really you know that's more really in, in the realm of course climatologists. Although I think I can provide at least from a tornado perspective, uh, which is the focus really of the presentation. Some some of what maybe a little bit of what some research has been showing on that. And you know I'll make a few couple of quick comments right at the end as well on that. So. So yes, yeah, so I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. So let me get pull up my. All right. So basically, just kind of take a look at uh, what the record is. In other words, what is our, our what is our climatology uh, when it comes to currently, of course, when it comes to tornadoes in Florida, some of the weather patterns also that are conducive to. Uh, to tornado formation in Florida. So this is the this slide shows the average annual number of tornadoes by state. So and it goes from the time frame from 1992 to 2021. So it's a 30 year period. And that's 30 years is the National Weather Service standard for how we determine what what an average is, whether it's an average number of hurricanes in the Atlantic whether it's how much you know average rainfall for a location or the average temperature, it's based on a 30 year average. So as you see here, um, you know, Florida is not generally known as a state that, you know, that gets a lot of tornadoes or these people don't generally associate Florida with tornadoes. However, if you look at the list here, if you look at the, at the map and you kind of look at the numbers for Florida compared to other states, Florida ranks fourth. So it's the, so Florida has the fourth highest number of tornadoes of any state. Uh, the, the, the top three are Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma, which is what you would expect, right? That's the uh, what, what people call or uh, refer to as Tornado Alley. So, you know, due to the, you know, so correlated, of course, to the number of tornadoes is this is the average, the average annual number of tornado fatalities per state. So you can see I, well, some of the states that stand out are Alabama, uh, Tennessee, uh, Missouri. Uh, those are the, the, the top three. Uh, Florida ranks a little bit lower on the list, and there's you know, and there's probably a reason for that, which I'm going to explain here uh, in the next slide. So, so the 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 higher death uh, average fatalities, at least per state, are really more. Not just in the in the in the middle part of the country, Oklahoma, Texas, but also shifted a little bit more over to the southeast U.S., which is something that we're going to be talking about as well. Now, if you break it down by county, so 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 these are these are tornado counts, or these are number of observed or reported tornadoes per county, and we're we're actually expanding the time frame here to 1950 to 2021. So if you look at that, uh, if you look at the the, the the counties that are in that uh, you know that bright red, almost like a burgundy uh, color, maroon color, I guess. Uh, notice how in Florida there's several counties that have a pretty high number, uh, and that includes uh, uh, Palm Beach County, also you know Broward's are like the next tier down, but then you also got um, in Central Florida you have Hillsborough and, and uh, Pinellas and Polk counties. Actually, if you look at the list there. Palm Beach County actually ranks fourth. So Palm Beach County, uh, at least for this time frame, has the fourth highest number of tornadoes of any county in, in the country. So again, further, you know, kind of making the point that yeah, you know, Florida does uh, get uh, you know pretty high number of of, of of tornadoes. So why does Florida not have that reputation then? And so I think this is where where we kind of get to that to that point. So this map shows the, the kind of a different way of showing the same data that we've been showing. So these are, this is the mean number of tornado days per year within 25 miles of a point. So it's, it's, I know it's a little bit complicated the way the, what this map is trying to describe, but essentially you can just relate it to, you know, number of tornadoes. So you can see Florida, certainly in these parts of Florida, especially the western half of the Florida Peninsula, has a, you know, a comparable number of tornadoes those two parts of the Midwest and Southeast United States. But where the difference is, where Florida then begins to kind of separate from, from the other areas is when we just factor in 
the strong, the violent tornado. So in other words, you know, we, we from the EF2 up. So you know the, the tornado, the, the the enhanced Fujita scale is, is our is the rating that we use to to rate tornado damage. So it goes from zero to five. Zero and one, of course, lower end of the scale, and then EF two start is what we call strong, and then threes, fours, and fives are become what we call violent tornadoes, where the winds are in excess of 150 miles per hour or estimated based on the damage. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we separate out those EF2s or higher, notice how in Florida, especially the southern half of Florida, those numbers really drop. So we, so, so Florida, and especially really the entire state of Florida, but more so the southern half of the state, has a much lower number or fewer, fewer strong to violent tornadoes than in, the, for example, the Midwest and even parts of the southeast United States. So because of you know, the, the fewer uh, strong to violent tornadoes, then, you know, most of our tornadoes in Florida tend to be in the EF0 and EF1. Most of them are, 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 are pretty brief in duration. Not all of them, but most of them are pretty brief. And at least on a relative sense, in a relative sense, don't have that, the, the same um, potential for damage and destruction as some of those long track EF3s and 4s. Like, unfortunately, some of the, <coughs> excuse me, some of the ones that we've seen and heard about over the last few weeks, uh, you know, this year, this year has been a pretty active uh, tornado. Um, uh, it's been a pretty active tornado season, more active uh, than than in many years here, at least you know, in, in the recent past. These are only tornadoes. Uh, water spouts are not counted here. Uh, tornadoes, of course, are land. Water spouts are water. So that's that's the. the difference between a tornado and a water spout. It's just it's it's a surface that they're that they're over. So we're just looking for the purposes of these. Of these slides, we're basically just looking at uh, at tornadoes. So this is that again. This is that uh, the breakdown, at least in Florida. And this and this came. This comes from our from our Melbourne office, which is the office that covers the uh, Treasure Coast, Space Coast, and East Central Florida. Uh, they did some stats, uh, and, and it shows that eighty eight percent of tornadoes of the tornado intensities were ef0 and ef1 so that's you know pretty you know that's a vast majority with a 12 percent being ef2 or, or greater so yes there are we, we can and do have ef2 or higher tornadoes but you know they're they're definitely in the minority here in florida and you can see how the ef ratings then correlate to the estimated wind speed ranges so just a little bit of a of a primer on the, this ef scale so the, um, the EF scale is intended to, or, it, or the EF scale assumes that we're not gonna measure the strongest wind in a tornado because, well, for, for many reasons, uh, one of them being their you know, tornadoes are, are too small and also form too quickly for us to be able to you know, rush out there and, and put a sensor out there. Right, I mean, at least in, in the majority of cases. Um, also, tornado, especially the higher end tornadoes, the winds are strong enough that they can destroy wind instruments. So you know, you and then so really, so that, those are the main reasons. So the EF scale is really rating the damage. So you know, we do storm surveys, we do damage surveys, we we investigate the damage caused by the wind from the tornado. Uh, we compare it to the type of structure, the type of, 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 of the, the, you know, what, 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 what was, what was damaged, whether it's building structures, type of buildings, um, vegetation, for example, trees, power poles, things like that. And we, then we have, a, 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 we have a scale that we can use to evaluate the levels of damage to these different types of structures. And we can correlate that to a, <clears throat> to a broad wind speed range, which is what the EF scale uh, represents. <coughs> so when you break it down by month, uh, actually right now we are in the peak of tornado season, at least historically speaking. You know, June is the month in which uh, most of the tornadoes have been uh, observed in Florida, you know, again, going back to 1950. Uh, but really, uh, really, mo uh, I would say that the time frame from, let's I would say March through uh, September, when it comes to tornadoes, 
that, you know, those seem to stand out. Uh, and we'll talk here a little bit more about what weather systems cause or can cause tornadoes here in Florida. But notice, though, there's no, there's no month when we've never had a tornado or when tornadoes are, are very rare. In fact, every month has had at least 100 reported tornadoes, even, you know, the, the relatively dry, you know, the drier months of November, December, and January here in Florida. We've still had, you know, well over 100 tornadoes reported each of those three months. Now, when it comes to those strong tornadoes, those EF2s are, are higher, those have tended to occur more so in the spring, the late winter and spring, February, March, and April. And there is actually, there is also a secondary peak uh, in June where we are right now as well. And there's a, there's a reason for that too, so we'll get to that as well. Now, at least in the southern half of Florida, um, this, this shows all the total severe weather events that we've recorded going back to 1950. And included in there, in, that, in those red bars, are the tornadoes. So this is just a breakdown for the southern part of Florida, not the entire state like in that last uh, last couple of slides. But it, it, it matches up fairly well. You know, our uh, most of our uh, the, the month of the highest number of tornadoes is June, followed very closely by August and then May here in southern Florida. So again, not a, not a big difference from the other parts of the state. Uh, but even here in, in South Florida, even in the months of November, December, and January, although tornadoes are fewer, certainly, uh, we still have had tornadoes each and every month of the year. Okay, so one of the causes, one of the weather systems that frequently uh, spawns tornadoes are tropical storms and hurricanes, or as we call it by its generic name, tropical cyclones. So let's just talk a little bit about that. And these some of this information was presented at the Governor's Hurricane Conference uh, in West Palm Beach. Uh, There's a yearly uh, yearly hurricane conference we have. Uh, it's held usually in May. So this was presented there. So tropical storms and tornadoes, I'm sorry, tropical storms and hurricanes <clears throat> often create an environment that is uh, conducive for tornadoes to form. But not where some people think, you know, a lot of times people think, well, you know, all that that real strong wind that's occurring or that that or that's around the eye of the hurricane, like the strongest part of the hurricane. Some people equate that wind with tornadoes. But actually, although the, those winds can be equivalent or as strong as, let's say, a strong tornado, those in and of itself are not caused by tornadoes. That's just caused by the very strong circulation uh, you know, around that that really intense low pressure area that that the eye of the hurricane is basically made up of, but where we do see actual you know real tornadoes in tropical systems is in the outer fringes or in those outermost rain bands that can sometimes be you know 100 or even 200 miles away from the center of the storm. So you don't have to be right in the path of the center of the storm to be in potentially at least in in, in the zone or area where these tornadoes can happen. In fact, the uh, in fact, well, these are the three deadliest uh, tropical cyclone associated tornado events in the state of Florida. So we, in there, you know, there were um, all three were hurricanes. So we had uh, Hurricane Agnes in 1972, seven deaths and 140 injuries. And you see the tracks of each of those down at the bottom. Hurricane Ivan in 2004, and then there was the there was a hurricane and back in 1882 that also um, uh, caused quite a you know a high number of deaths, you know, relatively speaking. So if you look at those three tracks there, the Agnes, Ivan, and the 1882 one, notice they have one general thing in common. They were both storms or hurricanes that tracked over the Gulf of Mexico, moving from south to north. So they were northward moving hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, and notice the Florida Peninsula rel rel relative to those hurricane tracks was east of that of those tracks. And we'll get to that here also here in a second. Okay, there we go. Um, more recently, Hurricane Irma in 2017. Irma was a hurricane that again moved from south to north, made landfall in southwest Florida uh, near Marco Island, and it just kind of moved due north over the uh, western part of the state. Uh, it spawned uh, 
quite a few tornadoes, although we don't know exactly how many tornadoes formed in Irma because the, what happened there was that the, the, the wind from the hurricane itself really, or, you know, from the core of the hurricane masked lightly, masked a lot of the tornado damage that could have occurred, you know, within those individual outer bands. But nevertheless, we issued a, between the Miami, Melbourne, and Tampa Bay offices of the National Weather Service, we issued a total of 91 tornado warnings in only 48 hours as Irma was approaching and then moved, made landfall over, over the Florida Peninsula. And you can see on the right, all of the, all of the warnings, the little the polygons were all the warnings that we issued, uh, the, the combined tornado warnings between those three forecast offices covering South and Central Florida. So definitely Irma being one of those northward moving hurricanes was a pretty prolific uh, uh, tornado producer. We, we think it was, we just don't have a really good number of how many tornadoes actually did occur. So one way to evaluate the risk of tornadoes in a given location, let's say whether it's a county or even like a city or, or a zip code, for example, is um, there, there are different ways to kind of evaluate it. One way is, you know, you, you factor in the likelihood, or in other words, you know, kind of the, 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 the climatology, if you will, then you multiply that by the consequence or the impact. Again, the, the stronger the tornado, the more of an impact it's gonna have, and then, that then then you multiply to that the vulnerability of that community, whether it's you know from population density, um, income, uh, number of mobile homes, for example, exposure to um, you know housing stock. There's different things, and there, you know there, of course there's quite a bit of subjectivity to this as well. So when you factor those in, this one map here comes up with the tornado risk and it's here it's broken down by counties. So the, 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 the darker the colors, the more vulnerable that county is to tornadoes. So you can see really a lot of the counties uh, in, in Florida, most, in fact, almost every county in Florida is at least somewhat vulnerable to tornadoes. And in fact, many of them are from moderate all the way up to extremely uh, vulnerable to tornadoes. Uh, even more recently, uh, 2022, in September, we had, if you're, you all remember, Hurricane Ian that made landfall in southwest Florida in the Fort Myers area. Again, a storm that moved from south to north, a uh, common theme here. And that tornado, oh, I'm sorry, that hurricane spawned a total of 13, actually 13 confirmed observed tornadoes in southeast Florida. So while the storm made landfall on the west coast of Florida, the outer bands of the, that hurricane extended across this eastern part of the state, southeast Florida. So while southeast Florida did not get the worst part of the storm, did not get the, the strongest winds, southeast Florida didn't get the storm surge from Ian. What South Florida did get from Ian, however, however were the tornadoes. So there were a total of 13. And you can see there, um, some of the tracks are easier to see because there were longer tracks. You can see there in the green shading, those little lines or swaths where the tornadoes um, occurred, or at least where we think they occurred based on a combination of uh, pictures, videos, and actual uh, damage surveys that we did. Uh, one of these was an EF2 tornado. In fact, the fact there were, there were a few EF1s, including one at North Perry Airport in Pembroke Pines which flipped over, I think like 10 planes. You see a picture of one of them there. And then this picture, uh, that was in, in the Palm Beach County, in Southern Palm Beach County near, uh, near Delray Beach in the Kings Point community, where an EF2 tornado, at least a tornado that was rated an EF2, based on the damage, uh, went, went over a, 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 that community and you can see some of the damage there. Uh, there there's other pictures here that I didn't show, but there's car, there were a couple of cars that got flipped over. Uh, in almost like entire, you know, like large tree branches got got flung over, you know, through the air and actually uh, went through a parts of these buildings and actually did quite a bit of damage. So these winds were, 
based on that rating, were probably as high as 120 miles an hour. Uh, so this was for 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 Florida standards, EF2 is pretty strong, and especially when you're looking at you know tornadoes associated with these tropical systems. Uh, this one here, th this is a snapshot of a tornado that occurred uh, in association with a Gulf of Mexico tropical storm back in 2012. This wasn't a uh, wasn't a really a big uh, uh, tropical system as far as impacts were concerned, but it did uh, produce uh, quite a quite a few tornadoes uh, uh, over the southwest part of the state and also over the central part of the state. Uh, in fact, so this 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 screen capture of the tornado was actually out over the Everglades, about 30 miles east of Naples. So again, just a, a good a good example of of where you know it doesn't really you don't need to have a strong hurricane to have tornado outbreaks associated with these tropical systems. Sometimes tropical storms or even tropical depressions have just the right environment or ingredients to spawn uh, quite a few tornadoes over the state. So as you've probably already gathered from these examples, uh, most tornadoes occur within the right front side of a tropical system. So in other words, relative to the motion of, this, of the tropical storm or hurricane, the right front is the area that where 80% of the tornadoes occur. So if you if you kind of look, look at the look at the at the distribution of the tornadoes and you kind of plot it, let's say like on a clock, let's say, or for anywhere from through anywhere from about 11 o'clock to about maybe four o'clock on, on you know on the on the hour hands, that's where most of the tornadoes occur. So again, this is relative to the motion of the storm. So if you have a if you have a storm that's moving from south to north, then just kind of draw a line from the bottom to the top of that chart. Every you know all the the, the bands that are on the on that northeast or east side of that storm are going to be the ones that are going to be more likely to produce tornadoes. And in fact, that's exactly what we've shown in the examples that that I've already given. For a storm that's moving from east to west, then you then you have to kind of flip over that graph a little bit. But again, it still shows you that most of the storms will most of these tornadoes tend to occur on the north or maybe even the northeast side of these of these tropical systems. Not, not all of them, but certainly you know the vast majority, at least eighty percent of them. And this is how you can relate it, like I mentioned before, to the hands of the clock. Generally, from about eleven o'clock to four o'clock for northward moving storm, and from about eight o'clock to one o'clock for a westward moving storm. So again, front right side, but you have to flip it over depending on which way the storm is actually moving. So when one of the things that we closely evaluate when there's a tropical system threatening Florida regardless of what intensity that tropical system is, one of the threat assessments, one of the hazard assessments that we provide are for tornadoes. So this is an example of the tornado threat assessment. Uh, this was ahead of Hurricane Ian back in 2022 for the uh, East Central Florida area. So you can see the area shaded in orange had a higher threat level based on, again, based on the meteorolo meteorological analysis and based off, you know, based on the forecast track of the storm in which areas we're going to be in that more favored quadrant or environment for storms to form. All right, so um, tornado watches are issued by the Storm Prediction Center. So the Storm Prediction Center is the National Weather Service office that is, in, that is responsible for coordinating with the local offices and issuing tornado watches, which are generally issued for, you know, large, for for a, a group of counties in the state, or sometimes they could, it could span across multiple states. So these are, are these are again, in, for tropical systems, these are often issued for the favored right front side, as we've talked about. And they're typically issued around 12 hours before the event is, begin, is expected to unfold. So some of the challenges of issuing tornado warnings. So then when we get to the warning level, to the warning stage, those warnings are issued by the local offices. So the the watch, the big picture watch is issued by the Storm Prediction Center in conjunction with the local forecast offices. 
then the tornado warnings are issued exclusively by the local forecast office. So we're using Doppler radar in order to determine the, you know, if there's rotation inside of a thunderstorm. And then that's where we base our tornado warnings on. So for these tropical events, for these tropical storms and hurricanes, these are very fast moving, very rapidly developing tornadoes. So sometimes we're not going to have much time to issue a warning before the tornado actually occurs. It could be literally just be a couple of minutes in some of these cases, but, you know, it, it requires, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, attention to detail. And there could be times where we could have, you know, several of these going on at the same time. And, you know, of course, in different areas. Okay, so we talked about uh, tornadoes associated with tropical storms and hurricanes. Let's talk about how tornadoes then um, can occur with non-tropical weather events. So, one of the one of the weather one of the you know global weather patterns that we typically key a lot of our seasonal outlooks on is the El Nino or La Nina, right? So, El Nino is a cyclical warming of the Pacific waters that then can lead to temporary changes in atmospheric weather patterns across not just the Pacific Ocean, but across other parts of the world as well. So one of the things that we've noted in the past, when we have these El Nino warming Pacific water events, when those winters in which we have the El Ninos occurring, we tend to get a, a southward shift of the jet stream. So the jet stream is a strong current of air loft that often dictates the storm track of low pressure systems moving from west to east across the you know across North America. So the farther south that jet stream is, the farther south the storm tracks can be. So the farther south being that they can actually come close to Florida. So in a in a in a typical winter across Florida, a more typical winter I should say, the jet stream tends to be farther to the north, and that's one of the reasons why. Your, torn, your strong tornado frequency tends to be up, up farther north, tends to be up in, you know, like the southeast United States or even like in the central U.S. But when that jet stream dips south, which can happen more often when we have the El Nino event during the winter, then those similar conditions that can produce strong tornadoes farther north of Florida can actually uh, happen then or become more favorable in Florida as well. So this is the more likely scenario as to when we can get these higher end tornadoes, these EF2s are greater in Florida. When we have these storm tracks that are farther south, that instead of being up over the central US, they actually end up being much closer to the Gulf Coast. And of course, with Florida in much closer proximity to these tracks, which again, when you have the jet stream aloft, that tends to create greater wind shear. And then that greater wind shear causes turning in the atmosphere which can then under certain conditions when thunderstorms are forming in that wind shear environment, that's when you can get rotation and then tornadoes to form. So here, these are, so, so this, this map shows the number of tornadoes in the winter when we have the opposite pattern or the La Nina pattern. So compare this to El Nino. So during La Nina, relatively few tornadoes because La Nina creates the opposite conditions. It, it tends to lead to the jet stream being farther north. However, when El Nino is occurring during the winter and, and the jet stream shifts farther south, now watch what happens. All those red lines are EF2 or greater tornadoes. And notice of some in South Florida, but the, the majority of these are over, over central Florida. And we've had several situations several uh, events in the you know in the not too distant past for example 1998 we had three ef3 tornadoes and then in uh, 2007 in lake county also in central florida we had two ef3s which led to 21 fatalities and 1998 and 2007 were years in which we had uh line el nino conditions in place and you see, you see here some of the pictures of the damage caused by those um, by those tornado outbreaks. Uh, unfortunately, both of these were uh, mobile home parks uh, in the central Florida region. 
So the last slide that I'm going to show here, and you know, I'll mention a couple of th things here in a second as well, is um, are, are tornadoes increasing in frequency? In other words, uh, you know, with 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 the observed and potential future changes, right? You know, increasing temperatures, for example. Uh, is that leading to an increase in tornadoes? Well, actually, it depends on where you are. Uh, here in Florida, actually, there's been a, oh, at least over the last 30 years or so, 30, 40 years, there's actually been a slight decrease in tornado frequency. Not a big decrease, but there's been a little bit of a decrease. Now, look at the areas in red and yellow from like Alabama, Mississippi, northward up through Tennessee and Kentucky. Those areas have seen an increase in tornado frequency. Why this is going on, there's, I really haven't seen a clear, definitive answer. Um, but the, but that, that, that's been a trend that's been noted where you know, a lot of these big tornado outbreaks across the country, and we've seen examples of it even this year, have tended to, to be also not just in the traditional tornado alley area from Texas northward, but also have been shifted farther to the east as well, including areas such as, again, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia, you know, parts of the southeast U.S. and even extending up into parts of like, uh, again, Kentucky, uh, even Missouri. So why is this occurring? That's that's something that's currently, you know, that that's I know has been part of studies and a part of ongoing studies. There's no real clear answer as to why. But I wanted to show this at least in closing to kind of give you again a little bit of a perspective of what the trends have been, at least here in Florida compared to other parts um, um, of the country. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up as far as the slides are here, but uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. So I'll, I'll temporarily stop sharing uh, my slides. If you have if you have something you want to see, um, I can share my screen again and I can show that. So, all right. Any um, any questions? Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, folks can feel free to unmute. Um... And I know there was some discussion in the chat if folks feel like um, they want to ask questions from the chat, feel free to jump in too. Well, I'd, I'd like to say uh, thank you, Robert, for that. It's very informative and it was actually really interesting to see um, and to see it explain the way that you did it. I thought it was, it was a really great presentation and I truly appreciate you taking the time. Um, to show us that. That did kind of clear some things up for me too, actually. Um, it was interesting because some of our conversations over the weeks have been, you know, seeing an increase potentially in more tornadoes, like in the uh, Panhandle of Florida, and especially, you know, in, in Alabama. I have a family in Alabama. So um, mm -hmm. it definitely kind of matches what you were showing in your maps. And I also noticed... Um, Interesting to see that, you know, when you had the vulnerability mapping, um, those those counties that were surrounding Lake O, that actually makes a lot of sense with some of the work that we do here at, at Pine Dog. Now, we're we're based in Palm Beach County, so, of course, I was glued <laughs> to a lot of what you were saying, and uh, I never realized that, that um, so many tornadoes were here, but it's true. We do get warnings um, all the time. Um, and, you know, we're certainly aware of, of you know, those, but uh, the communities surrounding Lake O are very, um, uh, they're mostly agricultural areas and, you know, they're flat and it seems like that might be a, a, a good place for a tornado to spawn, um, thinking about, you know, obstacles um, that it might, I mean, I don't know, I mean, obviously you're the, you're the uh, expert on that, but just interesting. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think some of those statistics. I mean, it, it's a combination of number of tornadoes and also the vulnerability. So, you know, those areas around Lake Okeechobee, there are there, there do tend to be you know more the communities there aren't as affluent as in other parts of the state. Uh, you're they're they're they're. I don't know. I don't have the numbers on this. So what I'm saying is just maybe just kind of based more anecdotally. Is there there tends to be a higher maybe a higher percentage of mobile homes uh, in those areas, which of course you know mobile homes are more susceptible to uh, to damage even from lower end tornadoes, uh, you know than a than your than a concrete block structure, for example. 
So that I'm sure is, is a probably a pretty big reason why those with a vulnerability index did show the, the higher values in some of those uh, more rural counties around the north of Lake Okeechobee. Any any other questions or comments? Um, I saw that Cass put in the chat um, that she is um, from the region and uh, she was just commenting that um, more tornadoes are seen during storm, se storm season, um, not necessarily associated with hurricanes, just the intense storm bands. Um, is that, does that align with kind of what you your professional opinion is too, Robert? Yeah, yeah. Actually, if you look at some of the, you know, if, they, if I were to show the, 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 you know, the, the distribution by month, you can, you know, June, May and June are, are well, June's number one and May is like usually the number two or number three. So that's exactly that late spring to, you know, at least the early part of the summer. It's, that is the time of year when we can still be influenced by uh, mid-latitude weather systems. In other words, you know, these storm systems that move from west to east across the country, which can temporarily produce those conditions that are conducive for tornado formation, like wind shear and things like that. And then at the same time, what's going on in, in May and June is our atmosphere here in Florida is becoming much hotter, much more moist. So the heat and the moisture produces atmospheric instability. So, it able, so that enables thunderstorms to form, air to rise. So then when those thunderstorms are in, in that in that unstable you know atmosphere is interacting with these jet streams and, and with these cold pockets of air way up in the top parts of the of the atmosphere that's what can lead to the to these strong severe storms that, that we typically get in florida during may and june and that includes tornadoes so yeah that's certainly very well very much in line with the uh with the data you know that, that we've been able to gather you know over the last several years hmm. that makes sense any other thoughts or questions, Robert? Actually, I did have one, and I feel like I either heard or read something about the Gulf Stream um, moving more eastward. Is that is that is there any trace to that from what you understand? I, I, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't have a lot of knowledge, a lot of information about the Gulf Stream and the changes there. From my recollection, it's not so much a shift in the location of the jet stream or the position of it. It might be maybe the the speed of the current itself. So you know, so the Gulf Stream is a northward moving current of water. Generally, I think it's like four like four knots, something like that. I believe it is. So you know, and it's one of the currents. Of course, one of the ocean currents that we observe. You know, across the world. You know, there's you know there's a whole network of currents that are tied together that are interrelated so you know the gulf the gulf stream is uh one of the functions of the gulf stream i guess or one of the things it does is it transports very warm water from the tropics from the caribbean and, and the southern gulf all the way up to the north atlantic so you know the, the gulf stream ends up going all the way up almost all, all the way up up to almost the scandinavia you know so it goes pretty far north um so a slowing down of the current, of course, would then lessen the rate at which this warm water is being transferred northward. You know, so, you know, along with the warm water, you have associated conditions such as, you know, localized areas of thunderstorms, which, of course, you know, can form, have at least a, a, a better chance of forming when you have warm water, which, of course, provides that warmth and instability for storms to form. So yeah, so there's so you know again, but that's that's about as comfortable as I can get as far as mentioning that those things. I mean, there's 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 been a quite a bit of research done on at least hypotheses or theories as to what might happen down the road. And there's no clear answer, you know, as far as whether the Gulf Stream is going to continue to slow down, is it is, is it gonna, you know is it going to shift or anything like that? But that's I mean, I know that is something that uh, is being looked at pretty closely by by a lot of climate scientists. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> two questions. One is, uh, are your slides going up on the, the clean site? Um, if not, can I get they, them some other way? <laughs> they, they can be. Yeah. Robert, if you don't mind sharing them with me, I'll post them on our website. Yeah. 
Not a problem. Some, some nice stuff in there. <clears throat> and the other question is, I believe the Atlantic is quite a bit warmer than usual right now. Um, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Just yeah. Generally. Well, they are. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're certainly. I mean, the the, 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 the data shows it, right? I mean, it's uh, and it's actually this has been going on for a number of years now. It's not. It's not something. In other words, yeah, maybe they're the the the. The levels at which they are are certainly, you know, uh, pretty high. But we think we've generally had warmer than normal waters in the Atlantic for really a number of years now. And it's probably, at least my understanding, it's at least partially due to a, um, a multi-decadal signal, which is called the Atlantic um, Atlantic Meridional Oscillation, I believe is what it's called. It's a kind of a complex term. Essentially, it's a it's a it's an oscillation. And we believe it's naturally occurring that factor, you know, that, that basically it, 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 it can, it can, it, it's like a temporary, um, not temporary, but it, it's sort of a change in the, in the currents mm -hmm. and also in the salinity of the, of the Atlantic. So the transfer of, 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 of salinity and currents from the North Atlantic or from the, from the Northern waters down to the subtropical and tropical Atlantic waters. So, uh, we believe that we're, we're in the middle, not in the middle, but maybe we're in this 30 year cycle. And, and there is believed that these these past cycles have occurred like in 30 year increments or 30 year cycles. So and these are can be closely tied to hurricane or tropical formation in the Atlantic. So during these warm periods, that we're, which, which we're in now, we've seen an increase in, in Atlantic tropical storm and hurricane formation over the last 30 years compared to the 30 years prior to that. Um, now, there, there is some thought also that, that, that the reduction in aerosols mm -hmm. uh, over the last you know, couple of decades has actually contributed to this cycle remaining and maybe even getting a little bit stronger because you know, we have less aerosols in the atmosphere. So, so, we, so we're actually bringing in more ultraviolet radio radiation, which translates to warmth. So there's some the, there's some thinking that that's going on as well. Again, these are all studies and these are all this research that's being done. There's no clear, definitive answer, but that's certainly one of those some of the things that we that were that that are being looked at at least in the uh, in the uh, in the research area. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thanks. You're welcome. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Any other? thoughts or remaining questions? Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Thank Otherwise, you. I think we can, um, probably some of us have two o'clock meetings, so we can probably wrap it up and um, just thank Robert again so much for his time and knowledge and answering our questions. And <laughs> um, it'd be great to have those slides um, and I'll post yeah. them online. Um, Sounds good. We'll do. And, and th th thank you all very much for your time uh, this afternoon. And and in, in, in the slides, there's also I, the last slide has my email address. So if you have any questions, feel free to to email me directly. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.